just I, to make sure we don't run out of time, so I don't think we will. It's not a hugely long training. Um, I, I will say there's a lot of veterans here, and I appreciate your support. I will say, however, this, this is sort of geared towards the greener attorneys. Um, there isn't any earth-shattering new information, really, on 2-6 uh, hearings, unfortunately, um, although we do have one good new case, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I think the first the reason why we wanted to do this particular training, honestly, is for the younger attorneys, especially when you're first starting out and you have those first handful of 2-6 hearings and you feel terrible because your client's going to be TPR'd when you're first meeting them and it's just a really stressful situation and you always think that there's something that you could do or should do that you're not doing and in fact that's really not true. So most of the work and this is what we're going to talk about in this training, most of the work is done before you get to the 2-6 hearing to try to prevent a, a TPR because frankly by that time usually it's, it's a little too little, a little too late. Um, so I'll just start by saying that um, in the case law, all of the case law pretty much, it emphasizes that it's a very heavy burden on the party opposing adoption. Um, the preference under the law is adoption, and so that is where the court is heading on these cases. And to, to, to sway the court and get the court to move off of that is, is tough. It's, it's really tough. Um, so there are um, the general rule of the court determines by clear and convincing. Uh, how do I do this? I just realized oh, I don't the have the thing. should be up there. That's it. It's Okay, so if the court determines by clear and convincing evidence standard that it's likely the child will be adopted, the court shall terminate parental rights and order the child placed for adoption. There are exceptions. Um, the first and the one that you're going to be relying on most often is that the parents have maintained regular visitation and contact with the child and that the child would benefit from continuing that relationship. And we're going to talk about the case that, is, that, that identifies what those considerations are. Um, the second is that there would be a substantial interference with the sibling's relationship with the child. We'll talk a little bit about that. I can tell you I am not aware of any cases, actually, where the court has declined to terminate parental rights on that basis. So I'm old enough to remember when that exception was added to the code, and we were all really excited. I actually represented children at the time. And then as we started trying these cases, it became abundantly clear that we really weren't going to get anything out of it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the standards and, and what, what your rights are as parents' attorney as it pertains to the sibling exception. Um, the child is unadoptable. That really does not come up in L.A. County, and the reason for that is our standard here is not to terminate parental rights until you have an identified adoptive placement, usually an approved home study even. Um, there are other counties that will TPR without having that, and so the adoptability issue does come into play more frequently, but it's just not our standard of practice here, um, unless Janet Eccleson is on your case, in which case maybe it might be. Um, um, and then uh, a child is living with a person who is unable or unwilling to adopt the child because of circumstances that do not include an unwillingness to accept legal or financial responsibility. That breaks down a couple of different ways, whether how old the child is, whether it's a relative or not. But um, suffice it to say that usually if there's a caregiver who wants guardianship, the court will, will allow that, um, unless you're in Department 404, which is a whole different analysis. <laughs> 404, you can come talk to me. You probably already know. Um, and then finally, a child 12 years of age or older objects to termination of parental rights. If the child is 12 or older and they do not want to be adopted, the court cannot terminate parental rights and, and order them into adoption. I had a case when I represented, no, actually I was representing a parent at the time. We had a case where a child had his parental rights terminated when he was 11, and they did not get to the finalization, and at age 12, he refused the finalization. So he made himself a legal orphan, and it was one of those unusual cases where we actually reinstated parental rights um, down the road. But, but if, if the kid's 12, and you know, minors counsel should know their client's position, but you know, if you need to put in over the 12, over age 12 child on the stand to elicit that testimony, you know, don't be shy about it. <clears throat> okay. Have you ever seen it, Amy? Yes. Um, has it, 
Do you think it would be successful or possible to put a child a little under the age of 12 on? I mean, I think that there's, and, and one of the cases we're going to talk about later, um, Scott B., I think that as the children get older, the, the court is more mindful of their wishes, and that obviously if they're getting close to the age of 12, that's going to come into play. You would use 366.26H, in which the court shall hear the child's wishes, and it puts the burden on minors counsel to explain adoption, and you can cross-examine the child based on that. So it's shall language. So right. you can use that um, to bootstrap the under 12 children um, to conclude an adoption. Right, although we all have to be mindful of Jennifer J. about kids testifying. So we're not touching on that here, but, but that is, if the court is found in Jennifer J. that you can't, the, the court can disallow testimony of children if the court thinks that's appropriate. Um, okay, so 366.26C1B1 exception. Um, it is a two-pronged test. Um, the parent has to have maintained regular visitation and contact with the child, and secondly, the child would benefit from continuing that relationship with the parent. <clears throat> um, the child must benefit more than just incidentally from the visits, okay? So there is a difference between, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, you know, they show up, they have a good time together, it's, it's a fun visit, the kid um, enjoys seeing the parent, is not the standard, okay? That's in, incidental benefit. Um, we actually just had a, a case out of Department 409, 404, it's an unpublished case, where the child was even having um, overnight visits at the parent's house for a period of time, but, but the court found that the visits weren't at the parent. We'll talk more about this a little bit. Wasn't acting in a parental role, and even though the kid enjoyed the visits, wanted to go for those visits. Um, I had a case once where we had a, a kid who was about, I think, 10 or 11 years old. This was Bridget's case in Department 4, 14 a while back. And um, that case, the, the child was having regular overnight visits with the mom, but it was found that the parent was not really providing any parental supervision or care, not cooking meals. It was the adult sister that was really taking care of the kid. And so that would be incidental benefit. They could enjoy going, but it wasn't enough um, um, to trigger uh, the benefit from continuing the relationship. Um, significant bond must be based on frequent contact with the one who stands in the parental role. Okay, so that's what we were just discussing. This is, it, the, we're going to talk in a, a little bit down the line about visitation and tips to give your clients, but just showing up, bringing toys, having a good time at the park is not going to cut it. Okay, there has to be an element of, of parental um, conduct. So your client, is the client preparing meals? Is the client disciplining? Is the client um, engaged with the child's teachers? Those kinds of issues. I had a case with Marpet where mom lived in the same home with grandma mm -hmm. and Marpet found that mother wasn't a parent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had a case actually the reverse of that. My client was, a, and if you've trained with me before you know this story, but my, the client, I had the, the child at the time, this was back when I was with CLC, the parent was a drug addict. She was using every single night, but she would show up every day at 4 o'clock when that kid came home from school, help the kid with homework, um, prepare the meal, bathe the child, put the child to bed. Then she would leave, go out and get high, and start the whole thing over the next day. So even though she wasn't able to assume custody of the child, she was definitely in the parental role. She was taking on most of the parental responsibility for that child. Um, the analysis of the benefit to the child of the continued contact must be viewed in the context of whatever visitation the parent has been allowed. This is from In re Brandon C. Um, it's important to point out that is a case where the judge decided not to TPR um, and the court affirmed that decision. I don't know if that same decision would have been made if it had been in the reverse. Okay, so they were affirming the court's decision and in that case there's language that talks about um, how you know you can't really fault the parent for not being um, uh, allowed to have more than just you know minimal weekly visitation. Um, also, and this is um, kind of a little bit off topic, but there's also in that case, Brandon, see very good language about the statutory requirement 
for DCFS to include information in their 2-6 report regarding the quality of visitation. We see so many reports where they're just like, parents visit periodically, or parents visit once a week at the DCFS office. Um, 366.21 I1B, um, and, and it's in the 21F, 21E, 21F, 22. Um, it's the same language. It requires them to uh, provide the court with information about the amount and nature of the visitation that the child's having, not just with the parent, by the way, but with other extended family members. So look for that, and if it's not in your 2-6 report, object, because it should be there. I'm sorry, can you get the site again? Um, it's, in, it's up here, in Ray Brandon C. Oh. 71 Calat 4th, 1530. And then finally, an adoptive parent's promise to allow parent-child visitation after adoption is irrelevant in the analysis, and the court must assume that visitation will cease upon C TPR. So a lot of times when it's a wobbler, the court's like, well, I think grandma's going to allow the parents to, to come around, so I, I'm comfortable with this TPR. That is not a legal analysis, and the court cannot rely on that in making its decision. You want to take over? You want to um, Even that hard to do the second part. Okay. All right, so um, so the, the chief case when you're at a 2-6 hearing is the Autumn Age case, okay? Interestingly, this is a case that the, the uh, appellate was challenging the constitutionality of the code section, essentially saying that it was too vague to say, you know, benefit from the relationship. Um, and so they were challenging the constitutionality, and, the, and their facts weren't really very great. The parent wasn't visiting all that often. The visits were definitely just sort of playful in nature. Um, but the court went ahead and laid out um, kind of their analysis of why it wasn't too vague, and here we're going to put some structure to it. Okay, so this is a case that is still the seminal case, and this is the case that all of the other cases rely upon. Um, so when you're considering whether the child would benefit from that continued relationship with the parent, the court must consider many variables, including but not limited to the age of the child. This is back to what Marlene was talking about earlier. The portion of the child's life spent in the parent's custody, and we're going to talk about that a little bit when we talk about a couple of cases um, that they were actually um, successful. Um, and positive or negative effect of interaction between parent and child, um, the child's particular needs. Um, one thing I'll say about this positive or negative effect of interaction between parent and child, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, I think, but, you know, everybody wants a bonding study. Ooh, let's get a bonding study. That'll help us. Uh, half the time the courts won't order them. Um, and oftentimes when the courts do order them, you do not get the result that you are hoping for. And here is the reason why, because a lot of times children are bonded to parents, but it's a toxic bond, okay? So if you have these really enmeshed parent-child relationships that are complicated and weird, that's not a case you want to send for a bonding study. I've seen so many of them where the, the assessor comes back and says, yeah, they're bonded all right, but it's toxic and it should be <laughs> terminated. Um, so just be careful if you, if you ask for that or if you try to use it. And usually you can't get a bonding study unless you have a minor's counsel who's going to be in agreement with that because their child has to be part of the, the study, obviously, or the 730. Um, so we don't, I feel like we used to do them more often than we do now. Um, the, the court doesn't really use them very much anymore. And honestly, I don't even know any 730 evaluators anymore that are particularly astute at figuring that out. But um, it is an option that's available to um, do you have any tips for dealing with information in the reports about children acting out before or after visits when I mean, you're talking about the 2-6 hearing specifically? I don't know that there's any case law directly on point. I mean, I guess if you were really, I mean, I think if you talk to any therapist or mental health evaluator, they'll say that that isn't necessarily indicative that there's a problem. Is there any, I think we do have a case. I don't yeah, I, are you talking about acting out specifically just before or after when we get those yeah. relative information? Yeah. One thing that you can do, which we'll talk about later on, um, in the past when I've heard that visits are going well, um, or if there's problems before or after um, a visit, we'll ask that the court allow our investigator to go and observe the visits to see, um, to really see what's happening during the visitation. Um, because many times this is just a one-sided claim. And so I think that actually helps us sometimes by having an investigator at least present during the visits to observe but I, that yeah. same person. And but. I think a lot of times, that, I mean, 
you know, I've certainly been told when I was representing kids by therapists when I would ask that question, it, it's not, sometimes the reason why they're acting out is because they are, are bonded to the parent and they don't want to leave the parent or it's, it's, it's difficult for them, to, especially if they're young, to really understand why the parent is just coming and going. Yes? Procedurally, when do you think it's best to do the, to ask for the bond study? I know everything's fact specific. At, at, at TFR, at the latest, I would say. Um, and don't call it a bond study yeah. because the bench will say determining bond is a um, finding of law made by the bench. And I don't need an expert for that. Exactly. Uh, I would say the positive or negative effect of interaction between parent and child. <laughs> Use the statutory language. There you go. All right, so we have a couple of cases um, where the automate variables were used successfully. Okay? Now, I'm just going to say this. For each one of these successful cases, there's probably 50 unsuccessful cases that are similar. Okay? We do not win many of these cases, and we're going to talk about some of the things that can help you kind of pad your record um, in a minute. Uh, but the two cases that we're discussing, dis not disgusting, discussing, um, In Ray Scott B, um, that child was 11 years old, so to Marlene and I think Emily's point, um, the child had lived with the parent for more than half of his life. Um, the interaction between the child and the parent, CASA reported that the bond was really strong despite the fact that visits were monitored. There's a lot of good language from the, from the CASA on that. Um, and the child's particular needs, were, it was an autistic child. And I think one of the things that the court stressed when we didn't have, have this written on, but I wanted just to bring it to your attention when you're reading it, is the court also talked about the child being emotionally unstable and in a precarious emotional state, right? And there was some concern that the child maybe didn't understand adoption, that, that maybe when the child had said that he was okay with being adopted, he didn't really know what that meant in terms of ongoing contact and communication with his parent. Um, I had a case years ago um, where I uh, represented a parent of a child who had something called selective mutism, where he would literally only speak to his mother, his biological mother, and his adult sister, and his teacher. Those were the only three people he would talk to. The foster parents who wanted to adopt him, who he had lived with for two years, he didn't talk to them, right? And so, um, shockingly, or not shockingly, the department was still recommending adoption by those people. Um, and that was a case where, you know, when the kids' therapist found out about it, we were able to get a letter saying, oh, hell no. <laughs> I can't do therapy with the kid unless his mother's there, because he won't talk to me either. So that's kind of a similar case where you have a child. It's really more about the child, right? Who is the child? Um, what are his particular issues? Why is the parent and that parental bond so important to this particular child? Okay? So that's one kind of case you can win, where you're focusing on those issues. And then, of course, we have, and I know you probably are all excited about this, it was just recently published, the NRA ET case. Um, it was talked about a little bit in the uh, case law training. Um, this is a real, I think, a one-off case. I mean, we just don't see cases with these facts getting overturned. And, it, and, it, and in fact, it just seems really, it's bizarre because I, I believe the children were removed at, at, at when they're infants, basically. Mm -hmm. And th this would be one of those cases where, if you have a case where um, uh, a parent comes in, baby's detained, they reunify at the 2-2, which we see a lot of, and then they don't have a right to um, FR once the child is re-detained. Mm -hmm. um, this is what this case is about. So basically, mm -hmm. the child was out, of, was out of their care for almost, I think, 2 one, two and a half and 2 2 yeah. then replaced back for approximately 20, 21 months, um, and then re-detained. And the children are so young, and they still found um, that, that there was some type of bond because of the time that they actually spent with her, even though the age is young. So one thing to really look at with this case, and what you can actually read from this case, and the other case, is sometimes if our client appears to be very sympathetic, the Court of Appeal um, will go in our favor. So we'll touch base on this a little bit later, um, but this is why sometimes it may be very important for you to call your client to testify so you can show that your client is a sympathetic person because the Court of Appeal is listening even if the trial court is So I think the two cases that are winnable, child with lots of weird issues, sympathetic parent. <laughs> okay. That's kind of the takeaway from this. Um, 
okay, sibling exception we'll touch on just very briefly, um, and I'm taking this quote out of one of the cases, relationship with siblings will rarely be sufficiently strong to outweigh the benefit of adoption, and I, as I said, I couldn't find a case where it was, so if you all know of one, by all means, tell me. Um, parent does have standing to raise the sibling exception um, as a defense to termination of parental rights. Um, there was a case recently where this was, um, the, the, it was in Ray I think it was subsequent to Ray JS. But um, basically the, the mom had a sibling that lived with her in the home, so it's one of those weird cases where they're still working through the system with the older sibling, but they've left the baby at home with them. Um, and, um, and the court did find that the mother ought to have been permitted to testify about that relationship between the two kids because there wouldn't have been another way to get that information. Yes. Um, when you're talking about the continuing relationship with a parent, in Ray SB says that the court must assume that visitation will cease upon TPR. But I've seen so many times when you're looking at trying to promote the sibling exception. It's right. It's a difference. Yeah. And is can we use this? Can we try to extend it? Or is there a case law that says they yeah. distinguish between them? Yeah. So. No, <laughs> not that I, not that I can see, unless you come up with some other creative argument. But I think the law is fairly well settled on it. Um, okay, so two prong test: children are bonded, um, and the child in question would suffer detriment if the relationship were severed. Um, long-term emotion. I'm just filling this in: long-term emotional best interest versus the benefit of legal permanence. Tip similar to the standard or, or the analysis you're using for parents. Um, important, it is irrelevant that the sibling, the sibling not being adopted would suffer detriment. I have always had a huge issue with this. I do not understand how the department can be <laughs> responsible for the care and custody of the older child and the younger child and yet be actively pursuing something that is going to har emotionally harm the older child that's in their care. And uh, that's never been addressed anywhere, but it's, it's an issue that really... I, I don't understand it, and it hits hard, but um, we learned that lesson the hard way at the beginning of this process. As I said, I was part of the beginning stages when this exception was first um, added to the code, and um, we didn't get good results, and the, the case law just came, kept coming in, kind of finding all sorts of reasons why that sibling exception should not apply, and this was made very clear that they are not interested in any way, shape, or form the effect it's going to have on the older kid or the kid that's not being adopted. Um, also important, there's, uh, this is not on the slide, um, but there is not any requirement for regular and consistent contact, the same way there is with parents, which I assume is probably just a, um, you know, a, an acknowledgement that the, the sibling doesn't necessarily have the ability to, to get himself to these visits. He's reliant on adults and other people to do it, so that's not one of the, the considerations. Um, so. Uh, factors that the court should be considering, uh, whether the children were, child was raised with the sibling in the same home, whether the child shared significant common experiences, or whether the child has a, an existing close and strong bond with the sibling. Um, they're not required to have lived with the sibling in the family home, um, and the juvenile court may find the exception applies when either the child shared significant common experiences or the child has existing close and strong bonds with the sibling. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of language and talk about this, but again, there hasn't really been any finding that, that it's applicable, as, as far as I can tell. Yes? In the MVP case, they found it applicable. They found it, did they? Yeah. I'll have to look at it again. That's not how I read it. I'll have to look at it again. All right. Um, and then just briefly, um, TPR of non-offending parents, there must be an unfitness finding made prior to termination of parental rights. Um, this is in Ray GSR. I actually represented the kids on that case. Um, the dad was just one of these guys who didn't have stability, didn't have housing, didn't have any money, could never take custody of his kids. Um, but the court had never made a finding of risk. And so um, the, the appellate court found that his parental rights ought not to have been terminated. Um, they've corrected that now because, as you well know, the, the court's always making findings of detriment even when a parent is not offending. <laughs> so just be mindful of that and, and object to it. And this is another example of objecting to things 
at the beginning of the case instead of waiting to the 2-6 because that finding can be, is usually made earlier in the case proceedings. Um, and it must be made by clear and convincing evidence. And um, this is from the NRA TG case. You guys can just read it. it. It doesn't come up all that often, so just take a look at it. Oh, sorry. There it is. Okay. Okay. So when do we <coughs> when do we start thinking about termination of parental rights at detention when we first meet the client? Um, as we know, the how the WIT code is set up is is to always do is is to is is to do con concurrent planning. And that's exactly what we should be doing, okay? So um, at detention, that, that's, that's the first time that you really start thinking about this. That's the first time you start um, evaluating the fact pattern that's in front of you to determine how you should advise your client, okay? So prior to the disposition, some things that you should be thinking about. First of all, 368 guardianship and relinquishment. I think a lot of us, especially in the initial stages when, when you first start working here, you're very scared of having a discussion about relinquishing their rights um, or uh, entering the guardianship and not having family reunification services. However, there are cer certain circumstances where this is completely um, uh, the, is, is, is the right decision for your, for your client. So for instance, the 360A guardianship. Everybody here, are, is everybody here familiar with the 360A? Yeah? Okay. So a 360A guardianship might be suitable in a case, for instance, if you have a client who, um, let's say, has a child who has always been in the care of grandma, um, has never been in the care of the mom. Um, and the case came in because, let's say, mom has another kid and there's some type of abuse uh, allegations regarding that kid. It may be appropriate to, to do a 368 guardianship with the older kid because the older kid has always lived with a maternal grandmother, okay? Um, or if you've got a case where uh, you have a client who's really unstable, has um, uh, doesn't appear to be able to um, get housing or get to a program or do what they need to do within the set amount of time. This is where you would speak to, to someone about a 368 guardianship. Um, or you may have a, a young parent who at the same time also doesn't appear to be ready um, to necessarily reunify. You would want to have a discussion, okay? Um, for relinquishment, if you have a client who's lost several children before, um, let's, say, let's say has lost several children and they're all placed with a maternal grandmother, um, if they're okay with placement with a maternal grandmother, you may want to have a discussion with possible relinquishment. Uh, the, again, these are scary subjects, but they're, they're not things that you should be too frightened of. You should be able to advise your client, because in the long run, it's going to be better for their case um, if they do a 368 guardianship or if they knowingly relinquish um, instead of going to a place where it being the termination of parental rights. Just to add one thing on relinquishment, and this is obviously is not a training on relinquishment. There was one, if anybody's interested. but. Um, <laughs> There's a difference between a general relinquishment that's done through DCFS, where you're just like, I'm going to just sign my rights away, DCFS, you, you do what you want with this kid, um, and, and a designated relinquishment, which has to be done by a private agency. Usually the, the, the person who is seeking to adopt the child will retain a private agency to do the home study, and they can do a designated relinquishment um, that way. So if, if your client says to you, um, I'm a drug addict, I'm not really ready to stop using, but I want my neighbor Sally to, to adopt my kid. Understand that doing it through DCFS and through their relinquishment process isn't necessarily going to mean that kid's adopted by Sally, so you need to make sure that, that you're dealing with a private agency to make that happen. Um, and I just want to give an example uh, for, for relinquishment. Um, for instance, I, I, I had a client one time who was severely mentally ill and she went, most of the time was living on the streets. There was one time, that, the, the, the time that the case came in, um, she was hospitalized, she had her baby, she came to court, she had a, a certain supply of medication, but she indicated that she tends to go off her medicine, that she knows she's not gonna be able to care for this child, she, she would like to relinquish. Um, there, that's a certain fact pattern that you would observe, that you would actually have that, that conversation with. I've had several, uh, several cases in fact where it's someone who, like Amy had indicated, 
um, someone who's not ready to stop using or someone who um, has mental health issues that's currently taking care of their mental health but indicates that they're, they're not in the situation to care for the child later on, okay? Um, visitation, visitation is very important. <coughs> when you first meet your, your client at detention, um, if the child is removed from your client at detention, you need to talk to them about how to visit their child. You would think that it's, um, that it, it's just something that they should, they should know how to do, but many, many people don't. As we know, for instance, when the department sets up, long, sets up larger visits, they automatically kind of remove the parental role from the parent, so it's hard for them to still maintain that parental role. So what you should advise your client is to bring healthy snacks, for instance. Um, uh, ask the child to bring their homework so you could assist with homework. Um, uh, tell, tell the client, for instance, not to bring other, other family, friends, or relatives to the visit necessarily because it's their time to have them visit with the child. Uh, also, it's very important to make sure that, um, that if visitation is not occurring, for some reason the department hasn't set it up, that you tell the, the client to call you and contact you so you could address that issue immediately. Something else that happens at detention a lot, check to see where the child is placed. Many times the department will place the child um, out of county and it makes it very difficult for the parent to visit. That is then an illegal placement and you can object to that and you should object to that because you need to make sure that, your, again, your client is visiting. Um, many times we've seen a parent do their programs but because of lack of visitation we somehow end up in 2-6 zone and we, we want to prevent that from happening at the detention. I had a question about the 368 guardianship. Yeah. Um, because I know I've tried in the past, but there was always like an issue with RFA and funding and everything. Would you be able to speak on that? Yeah, briefly, um, you, you don't need to have an RFA for 368 guardianship. Um, they, they, don't even need, they, they, they don't need to jump through the same exact hoops as if they were going to go through a guardianship for 2-6. There's actually a case law that says they don't even need a clean criminal mm -hmm. record. Yeah. In read summary. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, so I did a guardianship training. Um, I think that they'll, there's a packet that actually addresses that. I don't know if there's a, there's a link, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What makes out of, I mean, I know why, but yeah. what code section or whatever makes Placement out of county illegal. You know, I don't, I don't recall, um, but I will get back to you. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll send you that information. Um, so yeah, so again, at detention, you should be speaking to your client about visitation and make sure that they call you if there's any issue. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Any, anything else right now? Okay. Okay. So we just went over this detention. We should be doing detention to termination of, of FR. Um, relinquishment. We went over that. Second. Um, placement. So, as I said before, um, if a child is placed out of county, of course you should be objected to that, but also if a child is in foster care, you should be trying to seek some type of relative placement. Um, at the end of the day, if we do end up at a 2-6 where they're going to terminate parental rights, it's better for your client, um, and I think your client would agree, it's better for your clients to uh, uh, know the person that's adopting than not know the person that's adopting, because they're more likely to have some type of open adoption. So really try to push forward a relative placement. Um, also beware, there are potential standing issues after the termination of FR and whether um, there, there are potential um, barriers that could prevent us from actually requesting relative placement after FR is terminated. Okay. And there's some case law that's specific to that at the, at the TPR stage that talks about how you don't have standing to, to, to argue where, where your child should be placed for adoption because it doesn't impact whether or not your rights are going to be maintained or not. Um, can I ask you a question about relative placement? Yeah. Um, how do we push this issue with the department? I mean, we bring it up, I bring it up at the hearing. Mm -hmm. um, but even recently in another case of mine, the, the Miners Council has sent an additional, we've said in court, she sent an additional uh, email to uh, Coco and his response was just, I'm aware of the law. <laughs> and so is there another way that we can push it? Can we have a special hearing on this? Or I mean, yes, you could, I mean, it depends on what stage you're actually at. Um, Pre-adjudication, um, it's, it's just, you really try to address that at disposition, basically, yeah. and that's what you would try to do. Um, after TFR, it would be 361.3 hearing, am I saying that correct? Yeah, 361.3. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you would ask for a contested 361.3 hearing. 
And we have a training specifically on relative placement issues coming up at the end of March, March 26th, I believe. Um, okay, so something else that you need to um, look at also prior to FR being terminated is making sure that your client maintains educational rights. Um, that's, it's, it hasn't been as big of a deal as it used to be. Um, now they're doing co-educational rights, um, which is still a sense of limit on our client's educational rights. Um, but it's very important for you to discuss at detention with your client to make sure they're available, that they're um, uh, able and willing to go to IEPs, to um, any type of school performances and so forth. Also request that at the detention. So when you're at detention, ask that the, the parent be allowed to participate in school performances, school games, um, IEPs and so forth, okay? Um, and if they're not allowed, if they're not being allowed to um, to participate, again, tell your client to call you. You know, and if need be, walk the matter on. Okay. Um, again, like I said before, visitation. Visitation is super important. Every single every single hearing between detention and FR, and actually, until <coughs> parental rights are terminated, you should be talking about visitation at every single hearing. Next slide. Um, Got a whole slide. Oh. <laughs> Um, okay, so explain the necessity of visitation, because again, as we know, we've seen um, us get to the 2-6 stage, and um, we've seen possibly even TPR because the parent hasn't visited, okay? Um, if a parent lives out of state, <coughs> explore Skype and phone calls as an option, all right? Um, also, visitation for incarcerated parents and parents in inpatient programs. Even though a client is incarcerated, they still have the right to visitation. Um, the appellate court indicated that reasonable efforts, in fact, were not provided when the department failed to transport a child to have visits with her incarcerated mother. Um, so make sure you press this issue, okay? Um, and, and likewise, in Christopher D., the, the appellate court held that reasonable efforts were not provided when the department failed to set up visitation for a parent who was in an inpatient program. Again, visitation is key. If they're incarcerated, it doesn't matter. They should still be setting up visits. If they're in an inpatient program, they should still be setting up visits. I find that CLC usually pushes back if it's a young child, a baby, a toddler, two or three, and they'll object to visits in custody. Um, and I've seen bench officers handle it so many different ways. Yeah, I mean, make your record. Um, make the request, make your record, and if need be, if the, if the reason for um, any issue later on to TPR is because of lack of visitation, you will absolutely have um, your record made for you. I think at this point we should just address briefly, and we don't have a slide on this, um, but there's a case, Sophia M. I have the citation if anybody needs it, but um, my favorite case used to be Hunter S. Um, because Hunter S. sort of stood for the principle that when things are fundamentally unfair towards a parent, even though this parent certainly did not meet any of the, the um, autumn age variables um, on this particular case, um, the court was basically moved by the fact that, that she had been treated fundamentally unfairly by not by the department. She hadn't gotten the visits. The court had not made the appropriate orders. And so it was a great case for us because it basically said, how was the mother supposed to meet her 388 best interest prong if you guys didn't uh, allow her visitation? And therefore, the, the TPR was overturned for, those, for that analysis. But now we have a case called Sophia M. And it really pulls the rug right out of Hunter S. Hunter S. And essentially what Sophia M. says is, look, you know, nobody's going to be able to force this kid to visit. <laughs> um, and, and, and the court made the orders. I don't see what your problem is, you know. And it's up to you, counsel for parent to figure out how to make this kid visit with your client. So that's essentially the whole thing. It's terrible for us. It's a really, really bad case. But it, it, it goes to Christina's point that if you're being told that your client's not getting our visits, that they're not doing what they should be doing, that they're not following court orders, you have to keep hammering it because that's setting up your, your record for later on, okay? Under Sophia M, because that they didn't do enough, make enough noise, the court held that against the parent. Oh, I talked about that. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and then finally, I already touched on this. You need to explain how to visit, okay? Um, uh, we, in, in the past, um, years ago, we had an investigator that was allowed or permitted to go to some of the visits and would actually coach our clients on how to have appropriate visitation. 
um, which is really helpful because in those cases our clients actually were able to reunify against the odds because usually you'll have the case where you read mom and dad have done everything they've, they've completed everything however their visits are awful and, and when they come the mom's always playing on the phone and and dad's you know focusing on this one child dad never takes this kid out of the stroller and so really try to explore whether um, it's possible to have one of your investigators go and sit in on one of these visits and maybe even just kind of go over what they should do. So afterwards debrief on the visit. And, and um, it's almost like, I guess, visitation coaching, you know what I mean? Um, talk to them about um, how, hey, next time you should bring um, healthy snacks. Hey, why don't you do this? Um, it's really helpful. We in actually, that investigator that worked for us actually did a 12 tips for the visiting parent that we sometimes pass out to clients who are struggling with these issues. Um, uh, this needs to be updated a little bit, which is why I didn't make copies for everybody. This sort of predates like iPhones, <laughs> but um, but you know, and it and it did help somewhat because then when the attorney's talking to the parent, hey, remember when we gave you that? Like, why aren't you following those directives? And one of the things you're going to get a lot of times, your clients will be like, but I only get to see my client, my kid, two hours a week. I don't want to spend that time doing homework, or I want to bring them candy because that's what makes them happy. Um, so you have to just keep bringing them back to the end game which is return, number one, obviously, and if not return, at least avoiding TPR. Do you want me to talk about consumption? Um, yeah, sure. Um, okay, so this is what you should do at termination of reunification services. I'm gonna just take over for a minute here to talk about the referral to the consortium. Um, I made, well, I, you have here permanency planning mediation. Um, this is one of your handouts. Um, so. The Consortium for Children and Families, I think is the, the title, um, they are, they've been doing um, mediated post-adoptive contracts for many, many years. Um, their funding source is such that the referral needs to be made at the termination of reunification services, okay? So you, it, it, it becomes problematic when you have one of those cases where like it takes the department forever to find an adoptive home. So it's not gonna be appropriate on those cases, but if you're TFRing and at the time of the, of the TFR, you pretty much know where this kid is gonna be in permanency, ask for a referral to the consortium, okay? And then don't wait for the department to do the work, okay? There's um, information on here about how you can, um, there's contact information. Um, I actually have the name of the mediation coordinator, if you wanna write this down, her name is Samantha at consortforkids.org. Um, make the referral yourself, okay? So these are particularly, mediation post-adoptive contracts are particularly useful when you have a situation where, like the kid is placed with the family member, and there's all sorts of back and forth between your client and, and the maternal aunt. Sometimes they get along, sometimes they don't. Um, but if you can at least set up some guidelines so that going forward everybody knows what the expectation is for contact between the bio parent and the adopt and the child, um, it, 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 it's more likely that it will be successful. Okay, and these contracts, they can be everything from, you know, weekend visitation. I doubt that's going to happen, but it's possible to like, I'm gonna send you, I'm the foster parent who took this baby into my home because I desperately wanted to adopt a baby and now I got one. Um, but I will agree, you know, to send you um, a, a letter and pictures at Christmas. And I will give you some, some way to reach me um, or we can reach each other, like let's say that the kid has medical issues down the line or something. So even on the cases where you don't think it's, it's likely to be successful, you may be able to get something. They may be able to get something out of it for your client. Um, and they are sort of enforceable. You can read a little bit more about it in the in the information. I mean, it's it's not you know the, the, it's not going to undo the adoption if the adoptive parent is not abiding by the post adoptive contract. But it, it does. There are some teeth to it. So um, use those when you can. Um, I've been told that if it's a case um, where the two six is getting continued um, and there are strong reasons why the consortium should take a look at this they may be open to making exceptions so if you have a case like that it would be worth reaching out to them um, but as a general rule they're only going to accept these referrals at the time reunification is terminated okay turn it so is that um, email address uh, for the letter for or the number four uh, I think it's the letter four. Oh, it's a 
Yeah, yeah there it is. It's the bottom. Change the work here, so mediation coordinator's name is Samantha. I guess that's the same thing. So I heard the same thing, and they said if it's being continued for 120 days, the full term, then they they you can ask for the referral again, but it's up to them if they've already accepted. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's yeah, and that's why I'm telling you, like, reach out to them. Don't wait for the department to do it or for minors council to do it. Um, anybody can make the referral. So if you're talking to Samantha directly about it, there's, you're probably more likely to get them to make that exception for your client. But yeah, the, the issue is that the turnaround time is what I'm told. Like, so if you don't make it right at TFR and you're bumping up to that two six, they don't have enough time to make it happen. So, yes. Um, <coughs> Going back to the beginning of the case, I don't know what everybody else does, but when that child is placed with a relative, I start the parent on talking to the relative about the option of guardianship. When we get close to TFR, I call the relative yeah. myself. Yeah, there's, they're not represented. You can call caregivers. And I just tell them, you have the right to say you just want to be legal guardian for now. Oh, yeah, unless you're in Department 404. <laughs> don't do that in Department don't 404. Don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so something else, um, at the TFR stage that day, you should be planning on your 388. So talk to the client. Um, give, give your client that day um, a timeline of when they need to get information to you in order to file your 388. So we know that the 2-6 is going to be 120 days away. So when my client has their FR terminated, I will say, hey, in 90 days, I need you to contact me with all of your um, all, all of your progress letters and reports. If they're not in programs, I'll do an action request to have one of the investigators um, provide um, additional referrals to the client to assist them in getting in programs. Um, this also helps us, I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, if you're at the 2-6 and the client comes in with a parenting letter saying that they just were enrolled in parenting, you could say, Remember I, four months ago I told you <laughs> that we needed to do a 388 and you needed to contact me on this day? You didn't contact me. We gave you referrals. Um, so it's also CYA at the same time. Um, but really make sure that they understand that although the reunification services are terminated, it doesn't mean their parental rights were terminated. Many of our clients think that that's what just happened. They need to know that they do have an option for a 388 possibly in the future and make sure you have the discussion with them um, to try to set it up prior to the first two six. Um, finally, visitation. We've, this is visitation, 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 <laughs> visitation. Make sure you're talking to the client about visitation and the importance of visitation. <laughs> and, and by the way, objecting strenuously if the if the court tries to limit your client's visits to one time once a month or some craziness like that. Mm -hmm. Object to that. And there is some language. Um, I think it's in, in, in ET. It might be in ET. There's some language in one of the cases that talks about that, that um, you know, you have to allow the parent the ability to like make their 388 case. So if the court is trying to, to, to do that, unless there is evidence of detriment, like they shouldn't be limiting your client's visits. A lot of the times they say it's detrimental because the child needs to get used to not seeing their parent. Well, right. that would indicate that the child's bonded to the parent, so make that point. Uh, Christina, yeah. real quick before you move on, just building off of Sue's comment. Um, in preparation for this, did you guys find any case law regarding calling a caregiver about and testifying about how the social worker is forcing adoption on them and they really want legal guardianship? Has I, that been addressed at all? Like, I haven't seen it? anything, but I'll be honest, I was specifically <coughs> looking for that, but I haven't heard of anything like that. I've had a bunch of cases. Yeah. Well, actually, I mean, I know... I think I do because I think in the legal guardianship training there's there's an, there's a there's a couple of cases that actually talk about um, how they were only considering a, if, if I'm I'm not even sure if I remember correctly but there, there's one case I think in particular where they were only considering adoption um, because they're told that they had to um, but then be because under I don't know, although that, that that's not the requirement that was a requirement a long time ago like ten years ago. If they weren't, if the um, foster parent or relative was not willing to adopt, they could just move the kid. That's not the case anymore. Um, but yeah, I can't remember the case, and I'm not sure if there's any other case law. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm having a senior moment, and this came up the other day, and I just don't know the answer. So when there's a termination of reunification prior to the two six, 
but parental rights obviously are still intact. What, where are ed rights and the rights of the parent to make medical decisions, including the psychotropic medication stuff and all of that? The parents never have the right to make psychotropic medication decisions they unless you object. file a motion. They can object. Yeah. There's a formal. They get yeah, a they form. still until TPR they can still it's still supposed to be sent to them and they can still object. And what about ed rights? I, I think that it's the court would make a finding one yeah. way or the other. I mean, I think there are certain cases where the court would maybe leave educational rights intact, but I don't think you're going to have much of a strong argument if your client's just gotten TFR'd and the, the plan is to move to permanency. Yeah. So I think the court probably will often uh, change the, the educational the court, rights holder. The record is silent. It's the default setting until the termination of parental rights that parent still has end rights. Yeah, unless it's the court determines otherwise. <laughs> Okay, so the 388 and the 26 hearing. All right, this things are going to get a little wonky and different than what everything that we thought we knew <laughs> about about 26 hearings. Um, so you most people probably seen you know that you, you you have a case. The recommendation now today is termination of parental rights, and you want to set for contest. Many courts now will say, I need an offer of proof. That basically, I believe that comes from. Um, that goes from Tamika T, okay? Um, under In Re Grace P, the, it, the, the court said that there's, um, if there's actual, you, basically if, if you make a request or if your offer of proof includes a, a factual basis, that it should be granted. So for instance, don't just say, um, we believe we have the C1B1 exception, so I'm asking to set the matter for a contest. You need to say, um, based on C1B1, um, mom's having a uh, visitation this often, this is the frequency, um, the reports say A, B, and C. You need to make sure, make sure it's very detailed. Um, however, there's this new unpublished case, it's in 409, and um, there are, I think there's several other cases that have shown it to be this way. I, w I wish Jessica was here because there's <laughs> it would be easier to explain. But other counties. Yeah, so in other counties, um, in, in our county, we don't have a contest until they're actually ready to terminate parental rights, right? So um, if the home study is not complete, due diligences aren't done, it just keeps getting continued. So we don't really need to raise anything. In other counties, completely different. In other counties, first two six, once they decide, hey, adoption is a permanent plan, hey, then they need to set up for a contested hearing and show that adoption should not be the permanent plan. The unpublished case in 409 has indicated um, that I believe when we made the request for a contest mm -hmm. at the two six at the at the two six state when they're ready to actual terminate parental rights, um, they deemed it untimely because we didn't request it sooner. We they they had actually on this case it was our case um, and they the case came in they didn't have proper notice to our client right so it got kicked over for proper notice to our client and on the date that the notice was proper and the client came in and they were asking to TPR, our attorney requested to set it for contest and the court said that it was untimely because she should have made the request at the first 2-6 hearing. Even though there wasn't proper notice, we hadn't had an opportunity to confer with the client um, and the appellate court upheld it and actually was pretty punitive in their language towards counsel. So be mindful of it. If, I don't know how this is going to look for us going forward, um, but at the very least, you should be saying at that 2-6 hearing that's getting continued for an adoptive home or an RFA assessment, home study, notice, any of that, you should say, Your Honor, I, I'm informing the court that my client is going to be contesting the recommendation for adoption. Does the court want to set units on that day, or does the court want to defer that until we have whatever we're waiting for? Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a bad case. It's, uh, luckily, it's unpublished. And, it, it, unpublished. and there's other cases that were alluding to this as well mm -hmm. that have been published. On that un unpublished case in 409, would the, did Judge Stone let them proceed that day with the conference? No, she denied that. We asked oh. for that. Asked to put the client on, asked to take testimony, and she denied it. And the, the thing that's really upsetting about this case, and at least from my reading of it, is that the court didn't even need to do this because we didn't really have a strong Grace P argument for contest. The court could have just denied the contest on the offer of proof, um, but didn't. Denied the contest on the timeliness, and then the appellate court was like, yeah, you need to do this at the first setting. So just be aware of it. I have. Uh, I hope, hope it doesn't come up. I hope it's an anomaly. It's not published, but you all should be aware of it. What about the, what was that one case? Um, oh, no. I can't remember the case. Oh, 
there, there's one piece that, that was published that actually kind of alluded to this, um, but this one just kind of lays in concrete. So I mean, I think I would advise, you talk to your supervisors, but I would advise doing exactly what Amy had indicated. Um, just make your record and just a, a, ask the court um, if they're, they're willing to reserve your right to argue the matter or set the matter for a contested hearing on the 2-6, or rather, if they would rather um, have you set the matter then. Okay. Um, as Amy had indicated, um, the court may refuse to allow a child to testify if it would be detrimental under Jennifer J. She touched on bond bonding studies as well. Um, okay, so, yeah. The, 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 the tension between the <coughs> refusal of a child to testify and 366-26H, and the reason I keep pounding on this is that because Stephanie Miller, um, a number of years ago, called me and said that we should really here at Ladle be focusing more, very few people cite uh, 26H, and the, the key is, even if the child doesn't testify, the court has to go on the record and make that determination, and many times what the court will do will be turn to minor's counsel, and in the case that I was on, I went after minor's counsel because I said minor's counsel has to the, has a mandatory role to tell the court, you know, what they have to make their offer of proof that they alerted the child as to what adoption is and the consequences of adoption, and that minors counsel had to come on the record and tell the judge everything that they had told the child so that the child's wishes could be understood. And the judge did it, and minors counsel was furious. You know, I got the call from Leslie on that one. Mm -hmm. But um, they had to. So, and that was the case that I got the call back because it went up on appeal. Mm -hmm. And Stephanie came back and said, "Why aren't you guys doing it more often?" Yeah. So you can play with that because even if the kid doesn't testify, mm -hmm. it's still the role of minors' counsel to go on the record to tell the wishes of the child. Well, you can't get to the wishes of the child if someone hasn't said to a child, "You know, you get adopted, and your adopted parents move to Boston. You may never see your mom again." you understand that, you know, do you want adoption? That kind of detail really needs to come out even if the child doesn't testify. Yeah. And you can play with that and see what happens. Yeah. Um, you'll get the call from Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this, when a 388 is set on the same day as a 26, we kind of touched on this earlier, um, really consider having your client testify. Again, the Court of Appeal loves sympathetic clients. Um, use this opportunity, even if you've got a loser 388, use this opportunity to um, get all the information out from your client if you can on the stand. Um, because uh, if, if they're sympathetic, the, the Court of Appeal is more likely to actually rule in their favor. It shouldn't be like that, but it is, luckily. I think, too, um, it's, it's one of the things I think ET speaks to is that that's a case where the parents were on an upward trajectory, right? The 388 wasn't granted, the court couldn't find changed circumstances, but it was clear from the testimony and from the information that they were on an upward trajectory. They were doing well. You know, they were moving forward. So even though the court said, you know, there's no guarantee that the child will return or whatever, it, it, it definitely, that, that information about all those things that the parents were doing, I think had a big impact on why the court um, found that TPR was, was not appropriate in those circumstances. So. If you have clients, even if you're filing that 388, and I know we're only supposed to file it for change circumstances, not changing circumstances, but they're also supposed to be liberally construed, right? So there's nothing that says your client has to have completed programs to file a 388. Um, that's not what the language is. It's change circumstances, and the court can interpret that, give them enough information. Um, but, but even if you don't think you have what you need to win that 388, as Christina said, get your client on that stand testifying about all of these great things that they've been doing and all the changes that they're making in their life. Because you know, if you're appealing the TPR and the 388 findings, you're gonna have all that information that the court's gonna be mindful of. Something else too, I, I, that's not on here that I just wanna address. We, we talked about consortium. Um, sometimes um, mediation will also work with the family as well. So if it's too late for a consortium referral, um, you, you could try to request like a mediated agreement. Um, so that's available as well. Finally, lastly, the most important thing here is you get an ICWA reversal. Ooh. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> so, and it's, it's, it's awful because you'll get a client that'll be like, oh my god, they, they, I won on my appeal. And you're like, no, I mean, there's nothing that can be done, unfortunately. Because they're just there to make proper ICWA findings and that's it. 
and you're gonna have to have the hard conversation with your client, but there's absolutely nothing that we can do at that point. The only reason why it's reversed is because of ICWA. It doesn't mean they can file 388. Um, doesn't mean they can have a contest all over again. Okay. No visitation either. Yeah, no visitation, nothing. <laughs> and, and frankly, I've never, I don't know of anything case where there's ever been a, that, that ICWA, the, the notices were sent out and some tribe was like, hell yeah, I want to intervene in that case because these are usually the cases where it's sort of like somebody said my great grandma was Cherokee yeah. and then nobody followed up on it because it was not really a thing. So. Okay, thanks guys. Thank you.